I don't do drugs anymore, but we chew gum. What's up, everybody? I'm Finn McKenty. This is the Punk Rock NBA, and today we are here to talk about Suicide Boys. If you're not familiar with them, they are, I guess, what you would call an alternative rap duo from New Orleans that I think will go down in history as one of the very most important artists of this generation. And here is the reason why I say that. If 90s alternative culture was defined by grunge, punk, and new metal, and 2000s alternative culture was defined by post-hardcore and emo, the current generation of alternative culture is defined by all of that, plus the addition of rap and maybe a little dose of hype beast culture. And in my personal opinion, nobody currently embodies that more than Suicide Boys. And if you're not familiar with their music, they sound like this. And as of right now, they have over 10 million monthly listeners on Spotify, a platinum single, six gold singles. They've collaborated with legends like 3-6 Mafia, Monkey from Korn, and Travis Barker, among many others. And they've taken out bands like Turnstile and Code Orange on tours where they were selling out arenas. And to me, the coolest part of all of that is they did it all DIY. So the question is, how exactly did they do it? How did they go from two kids in New Orleans to to basically these genre defining future legends in less than 10 years? And what will their lasting impact and legacy be? Those are the questions that I will try to answer in this video. And also it is that time of year. The big game is finally here. Some people go to big game parties for the chili or maybe for the chips and dip and all of that stuff is truly, truly great. But you know what is even better is the real action which you can only find on DraftKings Sportsbook. And I am teaming up with DraftKings Sportsbook to give all new customers a winning offer. All new customers have to do is sign up for DraftKings using my promo code PUNKROCK, bet at least $5 on the big game, and you will instantly receive an additional $200 in bonus bets. That's right, new customers just bet $5 on the big game, and you will instantly get $200 in bonus bets deposited into your account. And what could you use those $200 in bonus bets on? Try out Same Game Parlays, which is where you combine multiple bets from one game, like which team will have the most passing yards and who will score the first touchdown of the night for even bigger potential winnings. And if mobile sports betting is not yet available in your state, don't worry. You can still get in on the fun with DraftKings Daily Fantasy. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. New customers use the promo code PUNKROCK, bet five $5 on the big game and get $200 in bonus bets instantly. That is promo code punk rock only at DraftKings Sportsbook. See what this fucking mask is on? That's the universal sign for leave me to fuck alone, okay? I don't like y'all. I don't like people. I'm sorry. I would consider myself a little bit late to the Suicide Boys bandwagon. I first heard them in 2016, a little bit after their song Paris came out, when I heard Rich Brian, of all people, mention them in an interview. So I checked it out and I was like, I have no idea what this is, but this is the coolest fucking thing I have heard in years. It was like 3-6 Mafia, but with the energy of punk and kind of the aesthetic of streetwear, I guess. But as I later found out their origin goes back way earlier than that. The two members of the group, Ruby and Scrim, are actually cousins who grew up together. And being from New Orleans, they were always into cash money and no limit rappers like Juvenile and Lil Wayne. But things took a little bit of a left turn when Ruby's mom said that he was not allowed to listen to rap anymore. And so he got into punk and metal bands like Misfits, Leftover Crack, and Slayer, and ended up playing in quite a few bands. The only one that I could find was called Vapo Rap where he plays drums and they're actually pretty damn good. They did some touring and put out a few records, but they kind of really never went anywhere. And he was just kind of getting fed up with the grind of being in a punk band. And at the same time, his cousin Scrim was also hitting a wall. He'd been DJing and producing, making beats after being inspired by people like T-Pain and Lex Luger. And he even got signed as an in-house producer by Universal Republic. But from what he says, it sounds like he got a pretty bad deal and really wasn't happy with the creative process where they would just like demand him to make 
make a beat in this or that style on like no notice and get basically zero credit for it. I got really screwed over all the time, just being young and signing something. While I was bored, I would make like mixtapes and shit rapping. And so to make a long story short, both of them were very passionate about music, but the path that they were currently on wasn't really working out. And so they said, fuck this, let's do something together. And they came up with the name Suicide Boys with the concept being, this is the last chance for us. If we don't make it in music by the time we are 30, then we are going to unalive ourselves, to use some YouTube friendly language. And the thing that I really want to point out here is that Ruby roots in punk were part of Suicide Boys from the very beginning. These punk aesthetics and the rap music and this I'm broke and I don't give a fuck type shit and I was like wait this is what's going Damn. on in underground rap right now like this is me I could fucking destroy this shit like these kids don't know what the fuck they're talking about like and as kind of a specific example of that their goal was always more than getting famous and making money they had a mission for their music that was much more in line with an old school punk band like MDC or seven seconds than mainstream rappers like future or the baby as they put it there's nobody standing up for anything anymore. It's all, I got a diamond chain and I fuck your bitch. That's fucked up. Why don't we say some shit that will better the world instead of fight each other over materialistic bullshit? And so the point I want to make is that punk has been part of Suicide Boys since day one. Obviously not so much in terms of sound, but definitely in spirit. And yes, obviously they are rappers, but they're not really a part of hip hop culture per se. It's really more like punk kids who happen to make rap. And so if you're asking yourself, why is this channel punk in the name talking about rappers, that is why. Because I believe that punk is an attitude, a state of mind, and a way of life, not a specific sound. And so in their case, yeah, maybe they don't sound like casualties or whatever, but they are most certainly punk in spirit, full stop. And once they started, they got to work right away. With their first release being a three track EP called Kill Yourself, The Suicide Saga Part One, which had a feature from Bones, who I would say at the time was probably the most important underground rapper. I wish that you could enter the dragon, the tables of the triple six, you want to stop the dragon, the never habit, the and to say that they were prolific would be a huge understatement. They followed that up very quickly with nine more EPs in the Kill Yourself series. Yes, nine. Collabs with some other underground rap artists like Ramirez and Black Smurf, and eventually their first full-length album, Grey Grey, in 2015. But their real breakthrough was later that year when Southside Suicide, which came out featuring Puya, who was another one of the bigger names in underground rap at the time, and I guess to this day. That ended up blowing up on SoundCloud and primed them for their first really big success, the Radical Suicide EP in 2016, which hit number 17 on the Billboard rap charts. And since then, they have just been growing and growing and growing every year, hitting basically mainstream levels of success while still doing everything DIY. And really quickly, if you haven't, I would love it if you would hit that subscribe button. It helps me and make sure that you don't miss any of my videos. It just kept building and building and building, and in 2020, 21, they got their first platinum single for the song and for those I love. Thanks for sticking around. As well as six gold singles. And their most recent album, The Long Term Effects of Suffering, hit number seven on Billboard. And again, this is all completely DIY on their own label. And to me, that is some seriously impressive shit. If there's someone else hitting those kind of numbers in any genre without a label, I'm not aware of it. They're really one of the biggest DIY successes of the past probably 20 years. And on a musical level, personally, I would say they just keep getting better and better and better. Especially if you take the time to really research all the different samples they use, read the lyrics and so forth. Almost 10 years into their career, I would say their newest release with Germ is some of the very best stuff they've ever done. And if you're not familiar with Suicide Boys, you might be saying, I don't get it. What's so special about this? Just sounds like every other SoundCloud rap song. And so before I go on, let me talk a little bit about exactly why they grabbed me so much and why I wanted to make this video. For one, when they started out back in 2014, 2015, the genre was not nearly as crowded as it is now, almost a decade later. And by the way, how terrifying is it that 2014 was almost a decade ago? I am not happy about that. Back then, it was a pretty small scene. There was Raider Clan with guys like Space Ghost Perp, Xavier Wolf, and Denzel Curry. And after that, Schema Posse, started by Jay Green, 
Green with Lil Peep, Ghost Mane, and Craig Zen, among many others. And really, that was mostly it. This was like a couple dozen people in total. And with Suicide Boys in particular, I think a lot of people kind of write them off as like a 3-6 Mafia or Bone Thugs and Harmony clone, but I don't really think that's accurate. I mean, clearly they take huge influence from 3-6 Mafia and just Memphis rap in general, but I think there's a lot more to them than just that. For example, even going back to their very early days, they have songs like Rain and Blood, which is obviously a Slayer reference and uses a sample from The Doors. And they've also sampled everything from Super Mario World to Boards of Canada. Their musical palette is way, way broader than just Memphis rap. But what really stood out to me in particular about them was this really overtly punk attitude and energy. For example, like I said, the first song that I heard by them was Paris. And if you watch that video, it looks like an underground hardcore show. I mean, they're on a skate ramp, people are moshing. It's like some dimly lit, dingy room and probably the wrong side of town. Obviously it is a rap song, but everything else about it looked and felt like a hardcore show. And as far as their overall approach, it really reminds me a lot of what Black Flag did back in the day. And for somebody who's also listened to rap since like the early nineties, I love that they also saw that that same spirit and DIY attitude was also present in rap. And we kind of just blend both styles into one. And so they took all of that and started their own label called G59. So they could have complete control over everything they do. It's the same thing as Black Flag, Minor Threat, and Bad Religion did when they were like, oh, nobody wants to put out our records? Well, we'll do it ourselves. Or on the rap side of things, it's the same thing that Master P did when he started No Limit. As Ruby said, we grew up with labels like Cash Money and No Limit, and those guys really inspired us because we loved seeing a gang of people that acted as one collective supporting each other and all. I come from a punk background. I've always said, fuck labels, I'd rather start my own. And it's not just the label. They've basically done everything DIY whenever they possibly could, just like a punk band would. In addition to starting their own label, Scrim has always done the vast majority of their beats and production. Ruby did their music videos and merch designs for the first couple years. They didn't even have a manager until 2017 when they were already getting millions and millions of streams. And where I think a lot of other artists in their position would see an opportunity to make more money and get more fame by trying to cater to more of a mainstream rap audience, they have always done exactly the opposite of that. Yeah, we kind of be like, oh, this is what rap is? Well, fuck this, we're gonna go over Fuck the cars, direction. fuck the diamonds, We whatever. don't care about the materialism, we don't care about all that bullshit. And that One example of that is their Grey Day tour, which they've done for, I think, three years now as the headliner, taking out bands like Turnstile, Code Orange, Knocked Loose, and Trash Talk on the like hardcore metalcore side of things, as well as alternative rappers like City Morgue, Shakewell, and Puya, among many others. Number one, I just think it's really cool that they're bringing together all these different branches of alternative culture in a way that I don't really think anybody else is. And to me, what's extra cool about that is that this tour is not some little 500 cap club tour. They are selling out arenas with this thing. For example, here in Seattle, they played the same venue as Jack Harlow, Alicia Keys, and Lil Durk. And again, all DIY. Would you ever imagine two white trash motherfuckers like us in an arena in the world? And for anybody who is still saying, I don't get it, what is punk about these guys? Aren't they just more SoundCloud rappers talking about Zans and depression? The answer to that is no. Well, actually, yes, kind of, but no, I'll explain. In the beginning, they definitely were that. I mean, as far as the mental health stuff goes, they put out 20 EPs in the series called Kill Yourself, and they had plenty of early songs like this one that talked about their heavy drug use. But where I think they're really different is that unlike a lot of artists, they're able to tap into that darkness in a way that makes their music feel very real and relatable to their fans without getting consumed by it like so many other artists have, for example, Amy Winehouse, Mac Miller, and the unfortunately very long list of other artists who died too young thanks to addiction. The actual like substance of the lyrics is yeah, depressing as shit, but if you're feeling depressed as fuck and you listen to that song, you definitely will feel a lot better knowing that somebody is going through the same shit, if not even worse. Both of them have very publicly dealt with addiction, in particular to opiates, but they both got clean a few years ago. And I think for their fans, seeing them get clean, relapse, and then get clean again is an incredibly powerful message that if you're going through this stuff, you can overcome it. Even if you make a few mistakes along the way, don't give up because you can get over it just like they did, which they have 
explicitly said is their goal for their music. I think that's when Suicide Boys really started to speak to what our fans were going through, especially with drugs, anxiety, and depression. We all know those things exist and people act like they want to help, but they don't ever do anything. That's why I hate mental health awareness sometimes. You can't just make everyone aware. We hope we can do more than that with our music. And you see that in lyrics like this that really remind me of Terror or Hatebreed, those kind of hardcore bands with a message about self-improvement. They've also worked a lot with the streetwear brand FTP, which gave them a lot of awareness and currency in that world. There are also tons of unofficial anime music videos for their songs that each have millions and millions of views. And so you put all of this together and you have what's basically the perfect soundtrack for being a disaffected teenager in the 2020s. It's like the Venn diagram overlap of underground rap, punk, mental health, drugs, streetwear, anime, aesthetic, and 90s references. And they're certainly not the first people to do that or the only ones doing it, but I think that they arguably do it better than anyone else. And there's definitely nobody doing it at the same level that they are. I mean, again, they're filling up the same venues as legit mainstream stars like Jack Harlow and Joji. That's it right there, bro. That's more than just a performance and like people getting bumped. That's like a connection. And so the last question is, what's next for Suicide Boys? And what will their lasting impact and legacy be? For one, although they obviously weren't the first people to do the Memphis revival thing, that was probably Jay Green, who they have also worked with. I do think that they have done more to make that sound relevant than anyone else. And if you don't believe me, here's what Juicy J himself said about it after he put them on one of his mixtapes. It was just amazing when I seen the response when I dropped the mixtape. They made that old 3-6 Mafia relevant as of today and by me jumping on those songs. And that alone is a huge deal because that Memphis sound is one of the very biggest things to happen in alternative music since At The Gates and Meshuggah. It's one of those sounds that when it came along, it changed everything and a whole wave of just thousands and thousands of artists all over the world started doing it. And again, they're not solely responsible for that wave, but I think they're probably the single biggest influence. And as far as what's next for them, I think we're gonna look back on them as one of the most influential artists of this generation. I think 10 years from now, if you read interviews with whoever the biggest artists in alternative music are, and you ask them who their influences are and who made them really fall in love with music, I think Suicide Boys is a name that you are gonna hear people bring up a lot in the same way as they talk about Slipknot or Linkin Park now. And although they are obviously rappers, I think they're probably doing more to get kids into hardcore than probably just about anyone other than maybe Bring Me The Horizon. By putting on Code Orange, Turnstile, knocked loose and so forth to this very, very large audience that probably wasn't aware of them before. And last, but definitely not least, with them overcoming addiction the way they have, I think they have a very positive message that's honestly badly needed. I love a lot of that underground alternative rap stuff, but if I'm being honest, a lot of the artists in that genre, I think they kind of do glorify drugs and mental illness. But with Suicide Boys taking a very deliberately different approach to that and consciously wanting to help their audience get out of that stuff, I think that they're honestly making a difference out there with a lot of young people who really need it. For example, their song Low Key, which is about both of them relapsing on heroin. Their transparency and willing to just be like totally honest about that is gonna help a lot of people who did the same thing and need some motivation to get back on the program and not just give up and let a relapse get the best of them. I found this quote from Ruby that really summed up the band to me. We just wanna make a footprint in the world because when you die and dead and gone, you want to be remembered. And if that's their mission, I would say that they're already successful. And personally, I couldn't be more stoked to see where they go from here. All right, my friends, that does it for this video. As always, let me know what you think in the comments. And I would like to thank everyone who supports me on Patreon, especially those of you who support at the true cult level or above. Patrons get all my podcasts and videos early. There are members only channels on my Discord that I'm super active in. I do giveaways sometimes, and there is a way to have me review your music. So if any of that sounds cool to you, hit the link in the description of this video. And with that, I'm going to sign off for now, but I will see you next time.